um, 1 Corinthians 11th chapter. We're going to do a little reading, so please hold on for me. The verse, uh, we're going to start at verse 17 through 30. 17 through 30. The Bible says, Now in this that I declare unto you that I praise you not, that ye come together not for the better, but for the worse. For first of all, when ye come together in the church, I hear that there be divisions among you. And I partly believe that. For there must be also heresies or factions among you, that they which are approved may be made manifest among you. Verse 20, when ye come together. Now, listen. I want you to get a pen out since we read and get your pen out. Every time you see the word together uh, or anything like together, I want you to simply underline that word. Verse 17 says, come together. Verse 18 says, come together. Uh, it, you're going to see as a theme here coming together. OK, please make sure you mark that. Verse 19 uh, excuse me, verse 20, when we, there it is again, come together, therefore into one place, notice it said one place and not on the internet, this is not to eat the Lord's Supper, for in eating everyone taketh before other his own supper, and one is hungry and another is drunk, and that's what that word actually means, drunk. What? Have ye not houses to eat and to drink in? Or despise ye the church of God and shame them that have not? What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you in this? I praise you not. The foolery of it. That's my added words. And I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he break it and he take and he said, take, eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner also, he took the cup when he had supped, saying, this cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, ye do show the Lord's death till he come. Therefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, so let us, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily eateth and drinketh in damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this cause, many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. Father, help us understand the importance of this sacrament today, Father, of this ordination, so that we can better understand and live and administer and receive this sacrament according to your will and word. In Jesus' name, amen, amen, and amen. You may be seated under the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Paul wrote this letter to the Corinthian church around 55 A.D. That was about 22 years after he had gotten saved around 33 A.D. And about 26 years after the actual first administration of the supper with Jesus and his disciples. He wanted to make sure that the church understood the detriment of taking this sacrament, this ordinance, incorrectly because the Corinthian church was doing quite a few things out of order. We have a lot of churches today doing things out of order. There are some things that I even think that maybe you could slide by even just a little bit. I'm not telling you anything or everything. I'm not even telling you most. I'm just saying maybe one or two things. If you don't come in in, in white, 
for your communion time and you decide to come in a pink dress instead of white. <laughs> I think the Lord will be all right with that out of orderness, okay? Because that's not God's order, that is man's order. We need to make sure we understand that there's a difference between God's order and man's order. You see, God never said that you needed to put white tablecloth on the communion table. You see, that is man's order and not God's order. So if by chance one day the tablecloth isn't clean and we got to come up in here on a Sunday morning, first Sunday for communion, don't think Pastor Courtney is going to say we cannot take communion because the tablecloth isn't clean or because there is no white tablecloth lining the table. Yeah, it sounds good that the church likes to say things like, well, you know, if there's a speck of dirt on the tablecloth, then there must be a speck of sin in the church. That's nowhere near Bible in any kind of way, shape or form. Form, but some religious ordinance that somebody placed on top of God's ordinance to make it sound good, look good, and act good. We got to understand, start really breaking up this thing and understanding the difference between God's order and man's order. Today I want to talk to you on the subject of this doing remembrance of me. You see, you've got to start thinking about what is it exactly that you're doing in remembrance of God? What is it that you're doing in remembrance of Jesus the Christ? What is it that you're actually doing to remember the very thing that he took care of us uh, in, which is taking care of our sin sick nature by paying uh, for the sins that we have already committed? What is it that we're looking at? You see, this is what we're going to get down just a little bit in the nitty gritty of these things. But the first thing you need to understand is we're not talking about what man's order is. That's not my goal today, but to talk about God's order. If somebody comes in in a jeans and t-shirt in this church and wants to sit down because they're here to take communion, you better not say a thing to them. Let them take communion because there is nothing in the Bible that gives uh, a uniform as to what you should wear. Yes, pastor got on this white suit this morning. You know, I don't wear a lot of white suits. But if I decided not to wear a white suit, I am not going to condemn myself to hell because Jesus ain't going to condemn me to hell either. All this religious rhetoric is just getting on my nerves. So let's take a look at the scripture today. There's three things I want you to get out of this message today. Number one, I want you to get the separation of the sanct in the sanctuary, the separation of the sanctuary. Number two, I want you to get the sacrifice of the Savior, the sacrifice of the Savior. And then number three, I want you to get the significance of of the sacrament, the significance of the sacrament. These are the three things we're going to talk about today. Paul wrote this letter to the Corinthian church because they were doing a lot of things incorrectly. One of the things they were doing was they were actually taking communion in the wrong way. They were actually coming in and having dinner and a feast and not thinking about anything that God was that Jesus did for us, but they have made such an intimate encounter with God very common. It's just you just come in church and you just eat dinner and you drink and you don't have a limit to your drink because you just get drunk, you know, and you feel all right. That's yeah, that's what that's what they were doing. They was they was having collard greens and, and they was having a macaroni and cheese and. And they were having some hog malls and they was having all this food and they was enjoying themselves and not realizing that this thing is a special thing that they were doing. This thing was an intimate thing that they was doing. This is a celebration that they were having with Christ. Now, I want you and no, I shouldn't say a celebration, a remembrance of what we were having in Christ, because there's a celebration and there is a commemoration. There's a celebration and there is a memorialization. There's a celebration and there is a memory of what we uh, 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 have come to do is to what someone has done before us. In this case, we are remembering what Jesus has done for us. 
Now, if you recall, in the beginning, I explained to you the first few verses had a lot of words come together, come together, come together. You've seen it at least three times. You should have at least three lines in your Bible just from come together, which explains to us that communion was meant to be done as a church, a local body of Christ coming together to decide they were going to commemorate what Jesus have done for us and remember what Jesus had done for us, not because uh, not because just it's just there to do, but because Jesus himself said this do and what remembrance of me. If Jesus is telling us to do it, we probably should do it. Now, he said as often as you do it, it didn't say every first Sunday. You see, there goes another one of those man's orders that we've placed in the pot. You see, there's nowhere in this Bible where it says it needs to be done on first Sunday or second Sunday or third Sunday, fourth Sunday or fifth Sunday. It says as often as you do it, you do it in remembrance of me. Remember God's or, or, uh, uh, order and not man's order is what we're dealing with today. If you decide, we decided to come to church on a weekday and decide to come and have communion together, this do in remembrance of me. I don't recall a scripture that says Jesus said this do in remembrance of me except on Sundays or Mondays or Tuesdays. It's a specific time. There is even the Catholic church that has even been known to do it every day of the week. Nor do you find that there is a specific way that it needs to be done in the church. There's no specific words that had to be has to be said when it's done. Yes, it's nice to have an order of what to say. And Pastor Courtney gets up here. And really, Pastor just gives you a, a loose, a loose uh, 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 reminder of what this verse here in 1 Corinthians says when I get up to give it. But if another pastor decides to do it differently, don't bother that pastor. That pastor's pastor in that church. You let Pastor Courtney pastor this church and lead a pastor of these other churches to the other ones. Let them do how they're doing it. And if Pastor Courtney wants to switch it up, if it's not switched up where it, the Bible says thou shalt not, then leave Pastor Courtney alone and let, let the Pastor Courtney work in the spirit of God versus the man that wants me to do the way he thinks it should be done. Now I'm going somewhere. So the scripture is here. He says he writes this portion of his letter to the Corinthian church in this first letter. The Bible says in uh, 11, the 17th chapter. Now in this that I declare unto you, I praise you not. In other words, I am not going to praise you for coming together in the wrong way. Yeah, that's what the scripture actually is meaning here. And you see, there's a lot of churches today that comes together for the wrong reasons. You see, some churches come together because they want to, to come because this is all they've known all their life. Us for no more, and we're going to come together and have some church. But we ain't worried about nobody else coming because it ain't about them. It's about us, and we're going to do it the way we do it, and it's only going to be us for, and we're going to just shut out everybody else. That's what a lot of churches, unfortunately, do today. Watch this. There's a lot of churches that's coming in and trying to do it uh, even for uh, the denominational reasons of it. Oh, I'm coming because I'm a Baptist. Not because you saved, not because you love the Lord, not because you praise in Jesus Christ, not because you're remembering what God has done for you, but I'm Baptist. My mama was Baptist, my cousin, sister's Baptist, and my grandmama and her grandmama vote in and her mama vote in. They're all Baptists, and so therefore, I'm coming to church because I'm Baptist. God never told you to come to church because you're Baptist. Nor even if, nor are you a part of the church because you're Baptist. You are part of the church because you're saved and sanctified. You're part of the church because you you have the Holy Ghost up 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 in you. That's that's the reason why you should be coming to church because you're part of the church of which you are coming to. You're part of the church of Jesus Christ. And dare I say it, some folks come to church because of a fashion show. They want to see who's dressed the best. They want to see who got on the prettiest high heels. 
They want to see who got on the biggest and prettiest hat. They want to see whose nails are done up the best and, and whose toes look good in the summertime poking out of them shoes. Some of your toes looking like fingers. But that's another story. I know I'm dead wrong for that. And I'm probably going to hear that later on, but that's okay. But I'm just simply saying, just because you think you look good, don't mean the world is going to think you look good. That's all I'm trying to say. Now, I've told many people in the world, just because it looks good on a mannequin, doesn't mean it's going to look good on you. In other words, stop putting yourself in the mix of coming to church. Stop worrying about the fact that you want to look good so everybody can praise you and give you compliments all day. But come to church because you're serving God. Come to church because you want to compliment God. Come to church because you want to praise God. Come to church because you want to worship God. You see, this is what we're called to do. But it's so much separation in the church. So much separation in the church. People just come in the church all willy nilly doing what they want to do. And God doesn't like it. And I'm not going to praise you for it if you're coming wrong. That's what Paul is saying. And that's what Courtney is saying up in this pulpit. We have to come to, to understanding that this church is supposed to come, as the word says, together. We are one. One body, one baptism, one faith. We are one. And it should be Jesus Christ that we put first before anything and everything else. I got to tell you a funny story. I'm reminded of a story about a, a young lady who went to a ball, a military ball with a young man. And the young lady and the young man was going to the military ball. And, boy, she had gotten herself to look really good. Boy, she had on the right outfit and everything was looking beautiful from head to toe. And she was saying, oh, I'm going to blow those men away when I get to this ball. They ain't going to know what to stop. They ain't going to know what to say when they see me. I'm going to look so good. And when they get, she got to the ball, she stood up tall and strong. And, and she was looking at all the men that was just looking at her and she just couldn't help but see how pretty she was because all the men were looking at her and everywhere she walked they just kept looking no one said anything they just kept looking and then finally one man walked up to her and she looked at him wondering if she was gonna he was gonna tell her that she looked beautiful and he said excuse me miss but your dress is in your pantyhose in the back and you might want to pull that down <laughs> I'm sorry. I couldn't help that one. The point that I'm making to you is, it, 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 you know, we all got flaws. It's not about the flaws, but we go to Jesus first and Jesus takes care of the flaws. Are you walking with me? All right. All right. So the, there, there is a separation in the sanctuary. The Bible tells us that I praise you not that you come together, not for the better, but for the wor worse. Not because you come together because you're praising God, but because you talk about people behind their back. Not because you're coming to praise them, but because of the fact you want to be able to have something juicy to gossip about later on and for the rest of the week once you get home. Uh, it's not about doing the right thing, but trying to figure out how you can make something that you saw in the church negative. God don't like ugly. Don't you ever forget that. Paul says in verse 18, first of all, when, there it is again, we, ye come together where? In the church. Don't ever let nobody tell you that we don't supposed to come together in the church. You see it in Hebrews, the 10th chapter. You see it here when you take communion that he talks about it being in the church. Don't ever let nobody tell you that the church age is over because that's nowhere in scripture anywhere. And just because somebody tell you that they 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 are having so they having their own worship with the Lord at home, that is not how God says that that's the only way to do it. 
First of all, you should be worshiping 24 hours a day, seven days a week. But the Bible says we should come together as one to worship him corporately so that we can he could get the praise corporately. And even in this part, this is a part of worship where we're coming to give him worship corporately and not just by ourselves. Forsake not yourselves assembly. I'm not sure how we get swallowed up in the lies of what people try to say. You don't have to go to church to, to worship God. The Bible says forsake not. If the word says it, then that means we need to be obedient and go to church. And I'm sorry, you cannot be together on the Internet. It's just not going to happen. Well, the Bible, the Bible don't mean together like that. It means that we could be separate, but together. That's an oxymoron. That can't be right. Some of some folk were looking for a reason not to go to church. COVID gave it to them and they still ain't in church yet. That COVID now seems to be long gone. The wheat and the tares. Let them go together because God knows how to separate. And that's all I'm going to say. The Bible tells us, he says, in verse 19, for there, he said, oh, verse 18, he says, when you come together, come together in the church. And then he says, I hear that there are divisions among you. Now, Paul is somewhere else and folk letting him know the Corinthian church is going through some mess. No doubt it could be the deacons fighting the pastor or the pastor fighting the deacons. No doubt it could be the women fighting each other or the men fighting each other. No doubt it could be the fact that they're trying to figure out which color blinds they should put up and what color carpet that should be put down on the floor. No doubt it could be who should park in what space. No doubt it could be somebody sitting in my seat. Why are they sitting in my seat? They know I sit in my seat every week and they have to come up here and get in my seat. Tap, tap, tap. Oh, you a visitor? Oh, I'm a, I'm, you didn't know that was my seat, baby. But that's my seat right there. You got to find someone else, somewhere else to sit. Yeah, the, yeah that's, that's the kind of foolery that churches would, would be doing today. And no doubt there was plenty of foolery back then when Paul wrote this church, as we know. You see, I told you there's nothing new under the sun. Solomon told us all that. You see, just because you see you got things going on in church today, it was going on under 2,000 years ago also that had to be addressed by the writer of this book. So we've got to understand there's a lot of things that could separate, but God is trying to bring us together. When we come together, when we come together, it should be for one reason, and that is Jesus. When it come together, it should be for one reason, and that is Jesus over uh, all of us. That's what we come together for. You see, if Jesus is over us, then everything else should fall down into place. If Jesus is over us as a church, then love should fall down into place because that's the main commandment. This new commandment I give you that you what love one another if a church doesn't have love within then my problem is is it really a church oh y'all clapping but I'm gonna tell you something that includes right direction if we got more fighting from the people in church whether it be any church including right direction then we do love for one another then you ain't got to question ourselves just like any other church have to question themselves. You see, Paul understood this and he needed the Corinthian church to understand that. You see, this was God. He still addressed them as a church, but they weren't doing church type things. Not according to God. You see, love brings us together. Love brings us together. Hold your place right where you are. Turn a few pages back to 1 Corinthians, the first chapter, in the 10th verse. 
You see, this is the beginning of his letter. And I want you to understand why this is so important, because the whole issue of the Corinthians, of the Corinthian churches, they had division. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 1, chapter 10, verse, Now I beseech you, there, uh, brethren, excuse me, by the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, that all ye all speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions among you, but that ye be perfectly, perfectly, maturely joined together Together in the same mind and in the same judgment. Let this mind be in you right direction, which is also in Christ Jesus. So it's not just an individual thing. Our mind should be like Christ, but it should also be as a whole, as a unit of the church. And then he goes on and talks about uh, who advised him of the uh, contentions that was going on in the church. Turn back over to 1 Corinthians, the 10th chapter, uh, to the uh, 11th chapter. So we have to understand that we, 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 we have to decide we're not going to be separated. We have to decide that we're going to live this life the way God wants us to live this life in church. Now, I should say this before I go on to the next point. I do understand why some people feel like they shouldn't go to church because, yes, they've seen so many churches. We've seen so many churches, either number one, fighting amongst each other, or number two, you've seen so many churches that's really not giving the word of God the way the word of God should be given. Now, I understand that, but you don't throw the baby out with the bath water. Is that what they used to say, uh, Deacon Scott? Don't throw the baby out with the bath water. Don't throw the church out because you see some folks that's dirty. Don't throw the church out because peep, you see some people who hadn't gotten it right. If at first you don't succeed in finding a good church, try, try again. And maybe if you put a little prayer with that, you might be able to find the church of which God wants you to go to. Because you have to understand, some of us are too busy trying to find our own churches rather than allowing God to place us in the church we're called to be in. And we let everything else take us out of the realm of why God wants us to be somewhere. Yes, right. Right. Instead of understanding that God has a purpose for us in the church of which he called us to be in. Yeah. So the scripture, the scripture goes on here. Uh, he says, uh, uh, for there must be also heresies or uh, heresies or, or another word for that is factions, issues that's going on. Uh, uh, must be heresies among you that which are approved uh, may be made manifest unto you when you come together before in one place. This is not to eat of the Lord's Supper. So now it tells you that it got these situations going on, these heresies that it seems to be approved by man but ain't approved by God and one of them is the Lord's Supper and we're going to deal with that just for a quick moment we're going to deal with the sacrifice of a Savior the scripture says here he says when ye come together therefore in one place one place it says this is not to eat now one place now, let me just stop here again because maybe my point hasn't been driven home enough you can't be in one place when you're at church on the internet y'all see i'm at an all-out war with this church internet thing don't you this internet church thing does it say one place or does it say many places at one time it says one place Amen, Sister Banks. So he says in this scripture, he says, this is not to eat the Lord's Supper. Now you're saying, well, wait a minute, that's what we do. No, you partake of the Lord's Supper. You don't eat it. What they're actually saying when he says eat is you sit down and you're feasting. Yeah, yeah. You see, now let's go back to the time Jesus had the first and the last supper. Right? Jesus sat down. You see, Jesus was with them. He took the cup and he passed one cup. Now, the only reason why we don't pass one cup is because I don't know what some of y'all lips been. <laughs> I've been waiting to say that this whole service. <laughs> I know, I know, I know. Shame on me. I'll, I'll, I'm just joking, but understand. 
we do know that flus and we do know that congestions and we do know that pneumonia and we do know that yeah. bugs and viruses do go around and we also know that it can be passed along by someone drinking behind another person not to mention some of y'all think that's nasty i know you do but when jesus did it they were one and it didn't matter my cold was your cold my flu that's your flu you see that that's just how that's just what it was because he took the cup and he passed that cup and they drunk out of that cup. They took the bread. There was no rubber gloves on. I know some of y'all think, yeah, yeah, yeah. There was no gloves that they was putting on their hands. Yeah. You see, they probably had less flus and less bugs back then because we so busy trying to keep away from bugs that we can never get our immune system used to stuff. But anyway, the point is, they didn't have all that on. He took that bread, he, he break it, he blessed it, he passed it. And they all ate off that bread. And then, don't you forget, that's when they had supper. And then after supper, he took a cup. And he took that cup and he passed that cup. That's what he did. Okay? So there was no eating, eating, eating. They had a meal in between. But the, the, the scripture is trying to explain to us that it is the breaking of the bread and the drinking of the wine. That's what it was. And I'm not going to argue with you if it was about wine or not. We know what they drunk back then. And obviously it busted was wine because Paul said they got drunk. So apparently it busted was a little wine that they had going on. And for those who like to say, well, the wine was not strong enough. Well, Paul said in Corinthians that they got drunk. I don't understand what I'm missing versus what y'all missing, because that's what he says here. Y'all got me on a good day today, boy. I'm going to just tell it. The scripture says for in eating, everyone take up before other his own supper and one was hungry and the other is drunken that's what it says right now here's the thing that you got to understand communion is not to feed your face to, to satisfy hunger or to quench your thirst it is to remind you what Jesus did Jesus sacrificed himself for us he paid for the sins that we could never pay for, for us. This sacrament is to remind us of what he actually did. You see, my problem is we come into church today and we sat down and we talk, talk, talk all through the, through the, 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 uh, uh, the communion. We just talk and just have whole conversations like it's all right. But this isn't the time to have conversations. You got conversations. You can have conversations anywhere else. But this is not the time to be conversing about stuff and laughing and having a good time. This is the time that we take our time and be intimate with the Lord. Remind him that we're thankful for what he did when he gave his body and gave his blood for us. This is what it's all about. The body and blood's representation was the, the, the bread and the, the wine. Or the bread and these days the grape juice. That's right. That's right. Matthew 26, 26 through 29. Mark 14, 22 through 25. Luke 22, 19 through 21. All these verses explain to you that very thing. Jesus himself said, this is my body when he passed the bread. Why is it that we, we laughing and key, key, key and passing something that represents Jesus' broken body? Why is it that we're laughing and having a good time and throwing our hands ah, talking about everything when we're passing what should be representing the blood that he spilled for us on the cross? You see, we don't have churches talking about this anymore. And even right direction, y'all know I love you, but we, we make the mistake of doing the same thing. 
Talking when we shouldn't be talking. Yeah. Laughing when we shouldn't be laughing. This is serious business. My grandmama said serious business. That's what it was. That's, that's what it is. Amen, Sister Banks. That's right. You know better, you what? Do better. Amen. So the, the scripture is clear. We got to understand the sacrifice. This is what this is about. We understand the sacrifice, what was given to us for eating, for in eating, everyone take before other his own supper. And one is hungry and one is drunken. What have ye not houses to eat or drink in? Or do you despise or hate or dislike the church of God so much that you disrespect the house? You see, first of all, if we coming together right, then if I'm trying to talk to Sister Banks, when all this is going on, Sister Banks said, hold on, we'll, we'll carry on this conversation after church. Because we're one. And where I make a mistake, she comes and she helps me get that straightened out and vice versa. That's how it's supposed to work, Sister Tucker. Am I right? We're, we, we, the Bible really doesn't say the words, we're helpers one to another. But it says these words, iron sharpens iron. That's what the scripture says. We're supposed to sharpen one another. We would have stronger people and stronger churches if we remember what the purpose of the church is. To serve God. See people say, strengthen one another, edify. But we forget about these things. Let me keep going because time going by so fast. I kept y'all a long time last week. I ain't going to do you this that, that way this week. So the scripture goes on to say, it says, what shall I say to you? Shall I praise you because you're doing this foolery? I, I, I will not. You won't get no praise here. I'm not going to lift you up and tell you you're doing okay here. Pat you on the back when you know you're wrong. We got a lot of churches that they just do what they do and think it's okay. Look, you saved. Yes, I know you saved. Yeah, you're going to heaven. But God still expects something from us. He still expects something from us. And don't get me wrong. Don't get me wrong. Because we got a lot of churches trying to fulfill man's orders more than God's orders. And it's confusing people. They are not realizing that they're not pleasing God simply because they're following the bylaw. I'm not telling you that anything is wrong with the bylaw, but I've said this over and over again. If the bylaw supersedes God's order, if the bylaw supersedes this word of God, if the bylaw supersedes what God actually told us to do, then it is not the Bible that's out of order. It is us that's out of order. And the bylaws need to be redone. And I would venture to say a lot of churches need to have their bylaws redone. We got to get this thing right, church. What are you remembering? Are you remembering people and, and the, old, the old ancestors that started the church? Are we remembering the, old, uh, the way that the Baptist church was created hundreds of years ago? Or, or are we really here to do what God says to do? Let me tell you something. Y'all know I love Pastor John Jackson. John Jackson is even, Pastor John Jackson is even on my ordination paper. I love him and I love all of what the Lord has used him to do. But if John Jackson had anything that was incorrect, I can't cannot let that supersede the word, but I've got to let the word correct what Pastor John Jackson did in respect. And guess what? The same thing has to happen after me too. Don't let people override God's word. You better know it too. 
for I received of the Lord. And here we go. Now he's going to explain to you some things. He's going to explain to you the significance of the sacrament. He says here in this verse, in verse 23, after he told him, I'm not praising you in your foolery. He says now, he says, for I have received of the Lord that which was delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night of which he was betrayed, took bread. Now he's delineating exactly what happened that night as to why we should be uh, uh, commemorating this night and, and remembering this night the way we should be remembering. We cannot continue to, to, to reduce the Lord's Supper to just a common occurrence versus understanding that we're supposed to be as a family. Now, here's the funniest thing before I keep reading that scripture. Do y'all know what communion, the word communion means? You see, here's the problem that we meant. Remember I told you to mark each one where it says together. Remember that part? The word communion means fellowship. It means to come together. That's why we call communion communion. Because it is a time that we come together as a family. Because this is a family. And we commemorate or we remember what Jesus did for us. As a family. So and he says, so Paul explains to us that Jesus at the same night he took the bread uh, of which he was betrayed, took the bread. The scripture says in verse 21, and when he had given thanks, he break it and he, 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 he said, take and eat. This is my body. So now he's explaining the significance. See, this is not a common occurrence that we're coming together just to eat and all willy nilly and just do what we want to do. No, we are com we are coming together to Remember what Christ has done for us. The scripture says, this do in remembrance of me after you've done that. And after the same manner, he also took the cup when he had supped. Remember, I told you, he took the cup after. He ate the bread before. After he had supped and saying, this cup. Now he's going to give you the, to signify what this means. This cup is the New Testament in my blood. In other words, this sig my, my blood signifies that the old way of doing things is now fulfilled. The law is fulfilled. This now, my blood ushers in grace. My blood ushers in grace. Now we're go this blood of mine is going to give a new dispensation. We're no longer under the law once my blood is spilled, but now you're going to be under grace. You might have, you might deserve one thing, but you won't get it because of mercy. And what you didn't deserve, you're going to get because it is grace. This is what my blood does, and that's why it's so significant to remember at this time. Let me give you something to think about here. The Bible says over in the New Old Testament that Jesus would be wounded for our transgression. No, uh, uh, and, and, and what? Bruised for our iniquity. Now, I explained to y'all a long time ago that wound, a wound is an outside cut. Those outside sins. And a wound, a bruise, is an inside wound, an inside sore that just hadn't broken out of the skin. That's why you get those dark marks under the skin. You have a wound, it just wasn't penetrated through the skin. Are you walking with me? Now you add this tidbit that I'm about to tell you now, right? You were wounded, that's a cut, in the skin. This is my body. Are you walking with me? This body was broken, wounded. Boy, I feel this one now. I don't do a lot of feeling. He was wounded, broken. Now, here's my body. It was broken for you. And if that wasn't enough, I'm not going to only take care of your outside sins, but watch this in my blood. On the inside. Is also going to be 
touched. And I'm going to spill it that very inside of me. The skin on the outside. The blood on the inside. It's going to take care of the inside sins. Those crazy thoughts you be having. This is what God is trying to tell. This is what Paul is trying to explain. To this is no time to be all doing what you want to do. This is not the time to be eating and drinking and being merry. Do that at home. You're here for a purpose. You're here for a reason. Let this sacrament be done for the right way. Then he says, because if you don't understand this significance, then it's going to affect your physical body as well as your spiritual body. You don't believe me? Take a look at the scripture with me here. The scripture says here, uh, for often as you drink of this bread and drink of this cup, you do show the Lord's death until he come. Wherefore, whosoever eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily, and I need to touch on this, shall be guilty of the body and of the blood of the Lord. Now you're going to have consequences for it. That's what it means. You're going to have consequences. If you don't deal with the significance of this thing the way the Bible says, you will have consequences for it. The scripture here explains us these consequences. Take a look here in that same verse that I read. First of all, you need to understand that when he says if you eat and drink unworthily, that doesn't mean if you sin and don't ask forgiveness before you come. I know now this is going to be a touchy one. You, you, you know, there's some people that's not going to agree with me. Y'all know me. I don't really give a flip if somebody agree with me or not. I, I got enough here to back it up in the Bible that tells me the truth. Now, everything before then explains to you that it's being that un unworthy is being done incorrectly, that you decided to do this thing all willy nilly with nothing behind what you're doing. Why wouldn't it mean the same thing when he actually says the word unworthy? In other words, when he says when you do it unworthy, he is saying if you coming in here not recognizing who Jesus is, if you coming in here and not recognizing what he did for you, if you coming in here and if you just eating and not even if you have made this thing common, you're doing it unworthily. Now, let me explain to you, I'm not telling you that you should not. Take your time and evaluate your life and ask the Lord forgiveness for any sins that we've done. That is not what Pastor is saying. What Pastor is saying is some of y'all done sinned and probably don't even realize you sinned. And a lot of us, we might ask forgiveness of something, but we might miss something. And then y'all, you, you, know, you know what we like to do. We try to cover all our bases. Forgive us for everything. Look, forgive me for everything, Lord. Well, you don't know what the everything is. In other words, my point to you is don't take the scripture out of context. The context is you are coming and doing communion incorrectly. You're not even showing the worth of who Jesus is when you do communion. So when you when you don't show the worth of who Jesus is, then you are unworthy. Not you as a human being, but the reason of why you're doing it. And it's because of that. Keep reading the scripture. He says, let a man examine himself and let him eat that bread and drink of that cup. For he that eateth of drink and drinketh unworthily eateth and drinketh damnation. Now, I didn't cuss in the pulpit. I'm just reading what the scripture says. Eateth and drinketh damnation to himself not discerning, not understanding, not understanding what the Lord's body actually did in this thing. And for this verse 30, many are weak, sick, and dead. Now I need to show you something here before we close out. Notice it didn't say dead. It said sleep. The term sleep is used for those who are saved. Not for those who are lost. Are you walking with me? In other words, if you read the scripture, it tells you clearly that even when you're saved, you could physically be touched when you do it the wrong way. I didn't say it. Y'all just read it. Did you not? Some of us wonder why we might be sick and we ain't doing communion right. 
Some of us wonder why uh, we might not be feeling the best all the time because maybe we ain't doing communion, right? I'm not telling you that that's the only reason. I'm not telling you that. What I'm simply telling you is it could be a reason. So maybe when we come into the house of God and when we decide to do communion fellowship together, we do it right because we are doing it worthily when we do it in the worth of Jesus. If we get that, we'll be a little bit better.